This is the lock picking lawyer. I recently posted a video of picking this Lockwood 570 cylinder. It's a six pin lock, has incredible bidding, and contains the beveled driver pins that Lockwoods are known for. I got through it relatively quickly and really didn't think too much of it until I got a lot of comments from people telling me how they had so much difficulty with those beveled driver pins. I didn't really understand what they were talking about until I started picking this Lockwood. This is a Lockwood rim cylinder, five pins, nowhere near as good bidding as this 570 cylinder, but it put up a fight. And I really didn't understand why. So whenever a lock like this surprises me or I don't understand the way it's acting, I do what we will do together on this video. We're going to take it apart, we're going to look at the insides, try to figure out what's giving us the problem, and then form a strategy for picking them. So this will be a three-part video. In the next part we will take a look at the innards of this Lockwood rim cylinder, and then if everything works out, part three will be a quick pick and gut. So, I will take this part, this lock apart and then restart the video. Okay, I have the lock apart now and right away I see the difference from the 570. We have beveled edges on both the driver pins and the key pins. Now, as shown in this diagram, the tapered drivers tend to wedge in the shear line and they'll require a couple extra nudges to, to set them after you have it at or near the shear line. The tapered key pins work in the exact same way, but in reverse. The tapered pins make it very, very easy to overset. They'll do the same thing these drivers do, and they will wedge up into the shear line. And because the tolerances are so good on these Lockwoods, they will stay there. So what that means is that as a part of our picking process, we need to regularly check for overset pins. Now, there's a lot of different ways to do that, but this is the way I do it. Forgive my drawing, I'm not the draftsman that Brian is. Let's assume these are our key pins. This is the front of the back lock, the back of the lock. I'll push my pin in till it hits against the first pin. I know that one's not overset. I'll lift it up just a little bit, push it till I hit the second. I know that's not overset, so on and so forth. And let's say after you you try to hit the front of the pin, you go all the way back, let's say from three to five. Now we know number four is overset. It's easy to deal with. You, what I do at least is I leave my pick right where that key pin should be. I slacken off tension ever so lightly until I feel that key pin drop back down onto my pick. I finish checking the lock and then I know none of my pins are overset. It sounds like an involved process, but once you're once you're doing it, it doesn't take more than, than three or four seconds. I do it regularly in picking when I think I've, I've overset something. So in summary, there's two things we need to do with these locks. First, the driver pins, because of that bevel, they're going to require a couple extra nudges once, once you have them at or near the shear line. And because of the bevels on the key pins, you need to check for oversets regularly. And if you find one, reduce tension to let it drop. So let's try to put these lessons to good use. I'm going to put this lock back together, throw it in the vise, and I'll walk you through a pick. Okay, I've got the lock back together. We're going to pick it open and I will talk you through everything that I'm doing. So hopefully you can replicate the process. I'm using a 50 thousandths pry bar and a standard hook. Okay, one's loose, two's loose. Three's loose. Okay, four's our binder, lifting him up. Got a little click there. Nothing from five, back to one. Nothing from him. Little click out of two. Mm, nice little click out of three. Nothing more from four or five. Okay, one's binding. Got a click there. Nothing from two. Click out of three, click out of four, nothing from five, nothing from one, nothing from two, nothing from three, little click out of four, 
nothing from five. I'm going to check for overset pins now. One's down, two's down, three's down, four is overset, release tension, I felt him come down, and five is, five is down, and I actually feel that he's a binder now as well. So I'm going to lift him up a bit. Got a nice click out of him. Nothing from one, nothing from two, nothing from three, four. I actually feel like five, yeah, I overset him, so let me let some tension off. And that's all it took. Okay, let's uh, take this guy apart so you can see that all those pins are still inside. My conclusions are that, just to summarize as I'm taking this apart, these locks really aren't that bad once you know what to look for and, and how to deal with overset pins. I actually need a shim to gut this because of that, that deep ridge right here. It's very difficult to, to slide the core out without something in there. Okay, here is all of our driver pins, I'm sorry, key pins. I managed to get every single one back, oh, backwards. <laughs> okay, now let's get the driver pins out. Okay, there's all of our tapered spools. Okay, let me give you a close-up. As you can see, all tapered spools on the driver and key pin positions. To sum up, there are two issues that you need to pay attention to on these locks. The tapered driver pins make it such that you need to give them a couple extra nudges once you have them at or near the shear line and the tapered key pins make it such that you really need to be vigilant for oversets. Check every now and then if you've overset any pins, release tension to let the pins drop if you do, and you should be able to wade through these locks relatively quickly. That's it for now. If you have any questions or comments, please put them below. If you like this video and would like to see more like them, please subscribe, and as always, have a nice day. Thank you.